like home. This is so amazing. What is it? The stuff that dreams are made of. You know how to get me fired up. I've got you. You've got me? Who's got you? Anybody else just get goosebumps? My name's Shonye Ogeni. I'm a producer and BAFTA Warner Brothers Scholar at the National Film and Television School. Um, and we're delighted to welcome Simon Emanuel, whose latest producer and executive producer credits include Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, due for release this summer 2023, The Batman and The Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, plus many more. Now, we're also very excited to be joined by Samar Pollitt, VP of Physical Production at Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, Samar has been working in the industry for over 20 years. Most of that uh, time was spent as a key second assistant director and then as a production manager working on films such as Kenneth Branagh's Cinderella for Disney, Tim Burton's Dumbo and Wonder Woman for Warner Brothers. Uh, Samar has also produced several short films and a feature documentary as an independent producer. Uh, so let's get straight into this and um, I'm going to start by asking Simon to tell us a little bit about um, what he's last credit was what he was working on and what he was doing there. Hello, um, thank you for uh, having us here. Um, I'm Simon Emmanuel. Uh, I am a producer, um, currently working on Indiana Jones, uh, which we're still in post-production on. We have a few more weeks to go there. Um, and also I'm working on a TV series called The Acolyte for Lucasfilm, which is a Star Wars television series that's currently shooting in London. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing at the moment. Wonderful. And Samar, could you introduce yourself to uh, our audience as well? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Samar Pollitt. I am currently, as of sort of last year, I joined in-house at Warner Brothers as a um, production exec and are looking after, I'm one of a team of three people that looks after the um, Warner Brothers film slate outside of um, Canada, America and Australia. Great. I think for a lot of our audience who are tuning in, uh, some of them might be familiar and others might not be so familiar with what the role of a producer is. I mean, some people in the industry even not necessarily. <laughs> so I think it would be really interesting to start with the beginning. That's always a good place to start. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Simon, uh, do you want to give us a bit of an insight into what interested you uh, when thinking about getting into the industry and how did you get into it? What was your first role? Um, I, I started out, I left school at 16 and uh, I went to work in London in post-production um, because uh, I couldn't drive. So I figured running around in Soho would be a good place to start. And it was in the days when uh, you literally used to cut on pneumatic tape and I would literally run the videotapes from one facility to another. And that's how I started. And then um, I've done a very traditional career path, which is starting out as a, as a runner. And then I went down the assistant directing route um, so being a, a third assistant director, second assistant director, briefly a first assistant director, um, and then production manager, uh, executive producer, and now producing. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a, it, there is definitely a career, a definite career path and a ladder um, to, I think, where Samara and I both are now. I mean, you've, you've, what you've just described there is a a route with someone who's really come up through the ranks. I mean, you've, you've, you've mentioned that in the space of 10 seconds, but how long did that take? I mean, that's a big... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it took me, um, I mean, I'm 48 now, uh, so 32 years uh, to get to where I am now. I My first producing role was when I was 39, which was Rogue One, which is ridiculous. Um, that, was a, that was an incredible piece of luck. Um, and... So I was UPM, uh, so a production manager when I was 30, uh, and then my 20s as an AD and kind of a PA from, yeah, 16 to 20. Um, so, yeah, it takes a while. And also there are lots of stops on the way that are complete careers in themselves. I mean, lots of people who are career assistant directors, uh, lots of people who are career production managers, career line producers. Um, so, yeah, it's not necessarily that you have to go from, you know, one place all the way to the end. I think there are lots of yeah, truly great careers along that path. I've just been lucky. Okay, and talented, I guess. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Smar, tell us a bit about yourself. And so I know you've got 20 years of experience in the industry. What was your entry route in? Yeah, I mean, I guess mine is very similar to Simon. I I did go to university and wanted to do film. So both of my parents used to work in film back in the 70s. And then they sort of went on different career paths when they decided to have a family because they just thought it wasn't very conducive. Um, so they always used to talk about it very fondly. And it was always something in our household that was, oh, I remember once when I was working with the tribes and this, you know, and it was like sort of this really amazing adventures that they went on in their 20s when they worked in film so it was always something that I wanted to do and I studied film um, but then of course it's a whole other ball game trying to get into film if you don't know anybody especially um, so I literally sent out hundreds of CVs um, and did as much work experience and working for free as I could whilst I was studying um, to try and just build up my CV as much as I could um, and then I was lucky enough to work at a casting agency that did extras casting and from there got to go on set as a background artist and um, and I thought you know this is for me really I, I sort of looked around at what everybody was doing and the atmosphere and thought yeah this is absolutely where I need to be um, and so like Simon then went through the AD ladder and you know luckily my CV landed on the right desk at the right time and I got a call to do um a program a, a mini series called Band of Brothers and I was supposed to go in for a couple of days and it ended up being six months work and then the people that worked on that then sort of employed me on the shows that they went on to do and it sort of spiraled from there and I went through the same path as Simon with being an assistant director and then a, a production supervisor production manager and now working in-house as a production exec okay and I think um I mean, there are different roles of producers, obviously, you've got your producers, executive producers, lots of different roles in, in, in production. But I think it's quite interesting for people tuning in today to have a better understanding of what happens in the studio system. So I think people are more familiar, perhaps, with what an independent producer gets up to. But do you want to tell us a little bit about, let's say, for example, the last film that you worked on, what your day to day looked like, what your main responsibilities were like in your role and what that was? I mean, I think you're probably best, <laughs> your best place to do this <laughs> um, is you've done exact producing and producing on that, on that level. Yeah, we can start, we can start with yeah. Simon, actually. I mean, Simon, you've got um, Indiana Jones coming out in summer 2023 produced. Do you want to give us a little bit of an insight into what that entailed, into what your day-to-day -day yeah. was like, you know? And even just in terms of the amount of people that you're working with, I think on the Batman, you had a team, I think, was it about a thousand people underneath you? Yeah. And a schedule yeah. of about 24 weeks? So yeah, I mean that's it's a little terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna give up after fun. this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh I said that the one of the wonderful things about the film industry is that there is so much variety. There is no day is ever the same. Um, and no phase of the production is the same. So Indiana Jones has stopped me if this takes too much time, but Indiana Jones, you you know, obviously start with the script, and one of the things you learn. If you're producing is getting to that point is really really hard getting to the point you've got a really good script and development i think is one of the hardest areas of the industry um to sit and work with writers and to you know to help hopefully come up with something everyone's excited by so that takes a long time um indiana jones that was years and years and years um in fact, I was attached to Indiana Jones in 2015 to give some context as to how long some of these processes can take. Um, so we get a script uh, in pre-production. Our job is to then sit and break that script down. So you literally go through each scene and you uh, you literally think, OK, how would I how would I film this? And at that stage, it's just a guess. And we put it into a program called Movie Magic. Um, and you literally write in the, the scene headers, the descriptions, and you end up with a, a sort of almost an Excel spreadsheet of the entire movie. Then we sit, tell me if this gets boring, then we sit and we literally kind of put it in the most sensible order that we can. We start thinking, what are all the things that we need? Um, and then you start budgeting. Uh, then the studio will tell you you're spending too much money. So then we spend some time trying to make it smaller and trying to make it simpler. Um, I've never, ever worked on a film that had too much money. 
Um, and uh, so you kind of figure out a plan and then we start hiring um, heads of department. This is assuming you've got a director on board already. Um, heads of department, production designer is the absolute key. Everything for a producer starts with production design. Um, how big are the sets? Where are we gonna film? Uh, the size of every set is so key because if it's a giant set, you've got to fill it, you've got to dress it, you've got to put people in it, you've got to service that. So for me, um, production design says everything about the scale of the film. Um, and, it's, and it's truly, I think, one of the keys to good management on a film. Um, so hopefully production designer comes on, we find our locations, we start designing our sets, we bring on costume designers, and then um, uh, people who are going to make the props that we need, um, special effects people, I could go on and on. All the elements that you need, we get closer to filming, we start panicking, uh, somehow we get to the start line and then we start filming. Filming is, um, for me, the best, the best part of it. It's so fun, uh, going to set every day, starting incredibly early, as Sam R knows, we generally um, will start filming at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, we either work, um, a 10 hour day continuous, which means you, you know, you literally work straight through no breaks until six, or we do a 12 hour day. A lot of departments have a significant amount of prep time beforehand and some wrap time afterwards. So I'd say to everyone on this call, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, life in, in that way. It's long hours, it impacts your social life, it impacts your family life. We're all desperately working to try and find more of a balance. And I think Warner Brothers um, are really uh, helping lead the charge there because it's, it is a, it's a growth industry. We want to get more people in and we're trying to figure out ways that we can find more balance. Um, we shoot, there's so much variety, you can't even get into it. Um, I'm happy to answer any specifics later on. Uh, we wrap, hopefully. Um, everyone is happy, hopefully. We, at that point, assess, okay, how do we do? Do we have any money left? Did we spend too much? What have we got for post-production? Um, and then depending on your role on the show, uh, some producers will finish almost the end of filming. Um, some stay on through post-production. And that's then uh, overseeing visual effects in particular, because um, on these movies, they cost so much money. Um, uh, sitting in with editorial um, uh, on indie at the moment, we'll do a final final sound mix um, next week. So we'll go in and listen to everything. Like hopefully that's it, and we get a chance to do final fixes. Uh, the scoring, um, the music, uh, final visual effects, um, and then you get into marketing and um, getting involved with with that and how people want to launch the film, um, what campaigns we're thinking of. Even thinking of a title takes forever. Um, and then hopefully the film comes out and God willing, people go and see it. That was a long winded story. But there we are. But it's really useful. It's yeah. super useful because I think the role of the producer, um, and this is why we're doing this panel today to demystify it. It's such a big role all the way through from prep and principal photography, post, then on to marketing, distribution, and all the different roles within producing. So it's really useful, I think, for our audience to hear what you've just mentioned today. But also, I think what's quite interesting also to know as a producer, what's your favorite aspect of production? What, out of all those different parts of the production um, process, what do you enjoy the most? Honestly, post-production. I mean, I truly love every element, but post is, um, firstly, it's a lot more relaxing because hopefully, you know, you've, you've, you've done a lot of the really uh, unknown things. And in post, you actually start to see a film come together and it's really magical. And for me, it's less pressure. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people in post-production who are working incredibly hard, um, but if things are going well, it's a really nice time to, uh, you know, just to sit back and, um, and yeah, watch something you've worked on come together. I think it's really important, by the way, to say for everyone, there's, there are so many different types of producing. And there is some producers um, who might raise the finance in the independent world. Um, and literally that could be their sole purpose is just to raise the finance and then give it to a bunch of people to go and make a film. There is uh, what we, I think most people term the creative producer who is the person that might find the project, find the script, find the director, 
they develop that and they're the person then that is on the set but not necessarily involved with the, the financial side or even the, the production management, but they're there to solely help the creative, um, you know, uh, get up on the screen. And they often are the person that will be there right from the start all the way to the very end. Then there are producers, which are generally executive producers in film um, or line producers who are kind of the most senior, um, senior production management. So you really are, you're responsible for the budget, you're trying to, you're hiring all of the crew, you're thinking about the methodology, how are we going to do this? And for me, I think there's a misnomer where people think that's that's purely um, a physical production job, but every single decision you make, and this goes to people in, in the studio uh, system too, as studio executives, every decision you make affects the creative. So to say that that role is not creative, I think is so wrong. Um, but those are kind of, I mean, Sam, I think those are the, main types of producing but there's lots of sort of different different types yeah absolutely i mean from the studio perspective there is uh you know certainly at warner's there are creative there's a creative team so there is a team of people that sort of help develop scripts and they'll buy material and they'll develop that material and then they they might you know sort of go out and hire producers for a show. Um, and then it sort of, once that script is formed, then it comes to the production execs to sort of work out where we're gonna shoot it, how are we gonna shoot it? How much is it gonna cost? And then it sort of then goes into, you know, early stages of, of soft prep. And we have usually an exec producer on by then that is really sort of doing all of that groundwork to, to figure all of that out with a creative team. So. Yeah, so there are lots of different types of producers. And I I mean, sometimes I still get quite sort of confused by it as well and sort of still have to think, well, is that person more the creative or, you know, because each individual I think really comes from different angles, you know, and it might be that a, a producer credit is given to somebody because they've spent the last 20 years working with that director, but not necessarily because their you know their experience is sort of you know independently producing movies so there is a a, a quite a wide variety of of producers so let's pick up on that because I think both of you both of you have had a, a wide range of experience in the roles that you've done within production within the industry but you've also worked together so I think it's quite useful for people to hear who are listening today what that entails you know what your roles were how you work together and how much you enjoyed it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I came on, I mean, I came on to, so we did um, the Batman together, but we also many years ago worked on the Harry Potters together when we were assistant directors. So I was a PA and Simon was a second assistant. And um, yeah, and then, you know, years later we worked on Batman together and I came on a bit late on Batman. There was the COVID shutdown and then sort of, there was a bit of a rejig in production management sort of team so I I joined a bit later but yeah I mean you know I was I I really enjoyed the project because the project was huge and it allowed and at a time of COVID there was so much problem solving as to how we were going to do things with all of these restrictions in place and and I guess for me that's the biggest challenge of the job is that you know, you're always, you're, you've always got challenges, but they're always so different. <laughs> and so you're, you're not often going over the same ground again, which makes it interesting. So I just kind of, I want to get like another explanation um, out of um, either Simon or Samar. So I think based on the fact people who are watching have different levels of experience and understanding of, of, of what the roles entail, for those who have a bit more experience and understand the relationship between producer and PM is like this, it's incredibly close. So um, Samar, would you like to explain to people what that relationship entails and, 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 and how you work together? Yeah, of course. So on the Batman, for example, I was sort of heading um, a unit that we were taking up to Liverpool. And so I was sort of responsible for making sure that everybody had the correct sort of communication when it came to sort of the COVID protocols that we were gonna have and 
and, and made sure that the hotels were booked and make sure that, you know, the transport was booked and make sure that all the departments were very clear on what the plan was in going up to Liverpool in the middle of a pandemic with a regional shutdown. Um, and all along the way, as I was sort of, you know, working on all of this and trying to put the plan together and communicating that plan, I was checking with Simon whether we were in the parameters of the budget, whether we were doing things in the way that, you know, Warners wanted us to do things. Um, so so I guess, you know, if, if you sort of imagine that Simon was kind of the top of the umbrella and then out came, you know, sort of all the other departments and we were help sort of supporting it really just to make sure that we were all, you know, working for the same goal. Um, but I, I guess I was doing a lot more of the sort of um, that direct liaison with departments um, and then reporting that up. And so I think you've got a really interesting, well, both of you got incredibly interesting background, um, but you've had the experience of working on independent short films as well as big studio feature films. Do you kind of want to explain what the main difference is between those two experiences? Yeah, more people and more money. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more money. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, I, yeah, when I was an assistant director, I really, I, I worked with a producer called Alison Owen, who did Elizabeth and Henry VIII and um, Saving Mr. Banks and films like that. And I was really inspired by her um, when I, I worked closely on a film called Ted and Sylvia with her and then the other Bling girl. And I was just really inspired by her. I really enjoyed how, you know, she I, she was very impressive in meetings. She was very sort of creatively connected to the project. Very, um, I, I liked her, a lot of her choices, um, you know, creatively and with cast, etc. And um, and I just thought, wow, you know, I'd love to be able to do something like that one day. So I started off by making these very short films with um, uh, with you know, producers that I met along the way as a PA and stuff. And so we would go out to like Lewisham Council and get £2,000 regional funding and then, you know, get friends together and beg, borrow anything we could to kind of put a short film together in like three days. Um, and I did that for probably about five, six years just to be able to say that I've done the process from the very beginning to the very end. Um, and it was hugely, you know, educational. It was really a really, really good way to get stuck in and to work with a director, um, to work on the script, to do things like that, which, you know, can take years to do in the studio system. So as a runner, you would never get to, you know, you would never get to have those creative conversations. But doing my own sort of short films, I was able to do that. Um, and that was, yeah, it was, uh, it was fun, actually fun times <laughs> yeah and also very I mean it's interesting listening to your both you and Simon's experiences because something that's very clear whether you're working independently or with a studio is a clear entrepreneurial instinct get up and go and that is a clear characteristic of all producers regardless of what role they're working in so I wanted to kind of ask Simon um, as well what would you say some of the key characteristics are for people, young people who are looking to get into the industry as a producer, especially within the studio system, what um, does it take? What do they need? What are the key characteristics and skills that they want to work towards to give themselves a shot at getting in? Um, tenacity is everything. So, you know, we get told no all the time um, and often for really good reasons. Um, but for me that there is, and I think for everyone, no is not an answer. It's not, not an answer we, we give. Uh, it should always be, if it is a no, it's a no, but we could do X. And I think um, that's what Samar, I think, is touching on with independent films is all filmmaking, everything that we do is problem solving. And whether you're problem solving um, because your resources are limited or you're problem solving, uh, as Samar just said, our Liverpool shoot in the middle of a pandemic, trying to get a thousand people um, you know, safely in, in, a, in a shooting environment, it's it's just problem solving. And I think the other key thing that Sama said is that on the lower budget movies, you've got less people. In some ways, that's easier because it's like trying to turn a boat. You know, if you've got a smaller boat, it's more nimble. It's easier to uh, to maneuver. 
Batman is like trying to turn a you know an ocean liner. Um, so it's just harder. <laughs> it's just harder to do. Um, so yeah, I truly say tenacity is everything. Like Sam, I started out writing. Uh, my mum said to me, write a letter a day to a company before email. And I used to sit and type a letter or write a letter out on my computer and I send one letter a day and you will get, unless you're very lucky, there's a lot of rejection. But that's what makes you different is if you don't give up, if you keep going. Um, I truly think that's the most important thing. I think having a love of film obviously is important, but it's amazing how many people actually don't watch enough movies. You know, go watch classic movies. Think, why do I love that? How did they do that? Like literally sit and, and analyze a movie, read, read, you know, read books about making movies, go to film school, do anything you can just to enhance your knowledge. Um, I think one of the things I always try to do is think, what am I going to need to know in the next job I want to do? And I try and learn those skills before I needed them. And to give context there, it's like um, this program, Movie Magic, which is scheduling and budgeting. I tried to learn that a long time before I needed to, and it, it really served me well. Understanding what a budget is, like go ask somebody. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think hopefully a lot of people are really keen to share their experience, to, to help. Um, so go ask. Uh, standing on a set for your, you know, hopefully everyone on this call who wants to work in the business gets to stand on a set and watch people. I mean, honestly, as a PA, I see sometimes PAs who are sat chatting on their phones. And uh, I mean, there's, there's a time for that, but it's such an opportunity to look at how all these departments work. What do they do? What are the things they find really difficult? How can you be helpful? Um, again, if you're on the floor and you are a PA, where we started out, one of the best lessons anyone ever said to me is try and stand in the eye line of your boss. So every time they turn around, you're the first person that they see. And it was a really very simple, but really good piece of advice. Um, watching where people go. One of the things you find on a, on a gigantic film set is, uh, where's Sama? And if you're the person that goes, I know where Sama is because I was watching and, and things like that, it sounds so basic, but it's really helpful. Um, then I'd say that uh, no problem ever sits with one person. And um, Samar, I think, was honestly underselling the, the complexities of Liverpool. And what I always try and do is to build really great teams with people like Samar, who I can go, OK, I know that person has got that. And I trust that person. If they have a problem, they will come to me and say, OK, I've got to this point. I need some help. Um, and that trust is, is huge. And what it does is... Frankly, it means if, if you're lucky enough to, to be um, near the top, if you've got really good people, you shouldn't have to actually do that much. And, and I'm not saying that to be lazy, but the whole point is, is structuring a management system. And also, then if there is a problem, you've got the time and the capacity to actually deal with it. Whereas if I was trying to organize Liverpool, uh, I'm going to drop everything else. Um, so I'd say also, yeah, don't be afraid to delegate. Um, yeah, it's it's not as daunting as it sounds. Um, well, I'd, like to, I'd like to pick up on that, Simon, that word daunting. It's a really interesting one because I think there's generally a perception of what a producer is, especially in the big studios or Hollywood or these big industries. And it's a very confident, it's a very brash, it's, a, it's someone who's mm. got their money, it's someone who's got the contacts. And I think that sometimes can be a bit of a barrier that can put some people off. They might think, oh, I'm not confident or I'm not big enough to, 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 to do this role. And as we've mentioned prior, there are so many different roles within it. But I think, you know, now that we've warmed up and we've been speaking for a little bit, we can, we've spoken about some of the practical skills. We can kind of go into some of the other skills which are quite useful for people watching. Yeah. And so I just really wanted to pick up on confidence that's a big, um, big issue for um, people who are kind of who are entering. And I wanted to ask in, in your experience, how did you build your confidence? And, you know, for some people, when they're coming into the industry, they feel like, oh, I might not be long hair, imposter syndrome, all of these yeah. different things can affect people. What were your personal experiences with um, that? I've got to tell you now, my, my company is called Any Minute Productions. And the reason it's called that is because I still think I'm going to get caught out at any minute. And they're going to walk in and go, oh, no, not you. Sorry, we made a mistake. But I swear to God, imposter syndrome, uh, everybody 
everybody, I think, has an element, unless you're incredibly fortunate, has an element of imposter syndrome. Every job I've ever done where I've moved up into a new position, I've been terrified. I mean, truly, if I think back to 20-year-old Simon and think that I'd be sitting now in, in meetings with people who are legends when I grew up and to ever think I would, I would be comfortable uh, is just, it, it's crazy. Um, but I'd say everybody is scared. Everybody is nervous. Um, if they say they're not, I would say uh, they've either got a problem or they're lying. Um, and the key is the key is overcoming that. Uh, I mean, I have a big thing about, you know, if I'm scared of something, I'll run headlong into it. And that's not because I'm brave. I just kind of know that if I can just get through it, and, and this is what experience gives you. If I can just get through it, I know it's going to be okay. You know, that thing of, I'm sure everybody has done something. You've been terrified of something. Maybe it's going up on stage or uh, whatever it might be, public speaking for me. Um, and once you do it, it's never as bad as you thought. And that is the one thing experience gives you when you have some really, you know, daunting problem or even a daunting meeting is is just you know you're going to get through it it's going to be fine um not being not being afraid to ask for help i mean something i do all the time um i also think a key thing for me and, and i think one of the things i've been very lucky at i over communicate so there's some producers uh will often try and hold things back from the studio um because they they kind of want to have that control and I've never, ever done that because as far as I'm concerned, two things. One is it's not my money. It's also not my movie. I mean, if Warner Brothers bought that script and they've hired that director, then it's their movie. And if I don't think we can afford something, then I should be telling them because it's going to affect the film they think they're going to have delivered. So it should be their choice. If we're going to spend more money, I, ideally I go to them and say, I think this is going to happen would you like to do this or would you like to do that? So you're always partnering with people. But the key thing here and the thing that makes it less daunting is by doing that, it's not all my problem. It actually becomes a shared problem. And, and somebody, uh, an AD who Samar and I work with, Tommy Gormley, uh, once said, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. And truly that sort of stuck with me. And it's always like, look, this, you know, if someone landed a script on your desk that was the Batman, you go, oh my God, how the, I don't know how to do this, but add the incredible thousand people that work on it and each person takes their piece. You know, it's, um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, uh, go ahead, Samar. I, no, I can meet you too. Absolutely. I think, yeah, spot on. It's uh yeah, it is one bite at a time. I mean, there's still instances now where I walk into a room and think, should I be in this room? I don't feel like I know enough. And then as I sort of, you know, get into the meeting and start talking about things and we start focusing on it, and then I realize at the end, actually, actually, I think I do know enough. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I think there's always that sort of element of fear that can surround you especially when you're working with people that may have been in the industry for 20 30 years longer than you um and you know have got a ton more experience than you but I think going head on into those things and accomplishing them is you know the way to see it really and the way to do it because that's how you grow and learn and become better at what you do ultimately mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're, we're hearing lots of feedback about your answers being very inspirational to the people that are listening. And I think the great thing about this panel today is that we're having a very upfront and honest conversation about the industry, about what it's like to work in the studios, about kind of demystifying what that means. So we've had a look at the practicalities, we've had a look at your roles and your skills. So let's talk about your experiences a little bit. Um, you know, my dad used to say, mistakes are just lessons we haven't learned yet. And I always think it's really interesting to hear about people's mistakes. No judgment. Samar, I can see you smiling. Mm. Do you want to tell us about one of your biggest mistakes and what you learned well, from it? <laughs> oh, I mean, I think really one of my earlier, in my earlier career, one of the biggest things that I learned was never say that you know something when you don't know it, you know? 
So I, you know, as a, as in my early career, career as an AD, you are constantly asked questions and it might be by, you know, quite sort of powerful people, actors, directors, producers, whatever. And I would think that I would always have to have an answer to that question, but sometimes I could lead somebody down a very different path and it could end up ca causing a lot of confusion and, and causing us a lot of time, which causes us a lot of money. And so um, I learned sort of very early on that if I don't know something, I should say, I'm sorry, I don't know, I'll check or I'll ask, as opposed to trying to make it up on the spot. And I think that sort of has followed me through to now, you know, I'll be sat in meetings where maybe I should know certain things, but I will always sort of put my hands up and say, well, I don't know, and I need to find out. Um, so I made a few mistakes there at the very, <laughs> in the early parts of my career. Um, but yeah. And, and Simon, what about yourself? Have you got any anecdotes for us that you're willing to share um, with the audience? Do you know, I was, I was literally saying, I mean, I'm, I make mistakes every day, like everybody else. Um, and for me, it's it's how you, it's just how you deal with those mistakes. Honesty is really important. I mean, I think that's something you learn, I mean, even as a, as a kid, but when you get older, and especially in the workplace, you realize the value of it, which is if you make a mistake, go, if you put your hand up and say, I'm, I'm really sorry, I've, I've made this huge mistake, generally people will rally around and they'll want to help you fix it. If you try and hide it, if you lie about it, uh, and God forbid you ever blame somebody else, then everyone will start looking at you and trying to find the truth. Uh, so I would just say, just always, always be honest, no matter how big a mistake, um, everyone makes them. I'd also say, to, just to reinforce something that Samar said, uh, being in a room full of people is really intimidating when people are talking and, um, and that thing of, God, I don't know what that is. And I think the higher you move up, the more incumbent it is for you to be the person that goes, I'm sorry, I, I'm, can you just wind back, just explain that to me in simple terms. And I swear to God, the look of relief you'll see on a room full of people who all wanted to ask that question, but were worried about it. So I really say like, uh, it's yeah, be that person, be the person that asks questions. And that really is the higher you move up, the easier it is for you to do. Um, and it just, yeah, it's, uh, it really helps everyone else. Okay. And I think, well, what's the opposite of that? Best experiences. So, I mean, ultimately, the roles that you're working in at the moment and where you're working in them, you're living people's wildest dreams. You're living your wildest dreams, possibly. <laughs> you know, what are some of your best experiences? I mean, between the two of you, you've worked on some of the highest grossing and most well-known films of, of our time. That's incredible. What what were some of your, if you kind of isolate some of the films you've worked on, um, what were some of your best experiences and why? First. Yeah, you go first, Simon. Uh, okay, uh, I would say, um, honestly, uh, and, and it is a wonderful thing, so, so, so many. And we all have these incredible days where uh, you think, oh my God, I'm being paid to do this. And those, that's pretty wonderful. And I don't think there are many people uh, who get to say that and say it as often as we do. Don't get me wrong, there are really hard days. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, going into a scoring session uh, with John Williams, and this is a recent one, but going in and hearing John Williams conduct an orchestra on a soundstage playing the Raiders March for the last time in history. And you're like, you know, that's like, I literally found myself thinking, oh my God, this is history. You're witnessing history. I think travel is one of the best things about this job and going on location with, honestly, it's, uh, you know, generally when we go on location, everyone kind of bonds and it does become a big family. And there's a, there's a lot of letting off steam, which can be fun. Um, but that's, that's a really, that's such a huge part of, of what makes this industry fabulous is the travel and the sense of family. And as Sam said, we worked together, you know, 20 years ago, and we've always kept in touch. And it could be you don't talk to each other for two years, but you see each other and you pick up like that. Uh, you end up with a web of interconnected friends. Um, and I, I really, I really, really love that. But it's a, it's, it's a special industry. And I would say the Harry Potters, just to put it out there, the Harry Potters is 
the the most fun and pleasurable experience I've ever had. It was so unique, and so and so, it's such an amazing thing to be a part of. Amazing. Thank you, Simon and Samar. Let's hear from you on that question, also. Yeah. Again, I think like one of the biggest things for me about the industry. I mean, for one, I'd say for anybody that wants a career path as a producer, whether it be in the studio system or as an independent producer, I'd say that it's it's not just a career; it's a lifestyle as well. You know that you you will be at times on on 24 seven and you will be having to carry your passport sometimes and be asked to jump on a plane in four hours and you know you will have those moments and those moments can be very exciting and um you know and 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 full of adventure but equally you know they do sometimes come with a kind of you know you're not at home very often and you're not going to be seeing your friends and family that often and things like that. So I think it is very much a lifestyle choice, um, you know, above anything. And uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, like Simon was saying, there's there's lots of brilliant people that I've met along the way. There is, you know, again, no two days are the same. There's so many brilliant things about it. And I guess like one of my moments of awe is when it's usually when I watch. So when you start on a project, you get the script and you kind of imagine what the scene is like and you imagine the performers performing and then the movie's cast and then you start to imagine that person delivering those lines. But actually standing on the set and hearing the director say action and you know, seeing those performers bring the script to life is when usually my jaw drops and I'm like, oh my God, am I really here? <laughs> so that is the most sort of awe moment for me every time. And Tamara, just following on from that, I know both yourself and Simon have spoken about opportunity um, within the studio system and the opportunity that you can create for yourself. I always want to follow on from that. So I know that you do a lot of work with young people, encouraging them to get into the industry, especially people from backgrounds who don't necessarily feel like they could necessarily enter this industry. What words of inspiration do you have to people who look at this, these studios or look at this industry and think, well, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know if there's a place for me here. In 2023, what do you say to that? Um... I would say that, I mean, when I first started in the industry and it's it's getting better, it's not there yet, but um, it was not, it's not a diverse industry. And, you know, there wasn't anybody doing what I wanted to do that looked like me, you know, and especially in the UK, perhaps in, in the States, but not here. But that is getting better. And, you know, especially at Warner Brothers, we're really championing, opening the doors wider, creating paths for people from diverse backgrounds to, um, you know, to to enter the industry as, as entry level or people that are sort of wanting to move over from other industries into film. So I guess, you know, there's not just me, but there's a lot of people out there now championing for um, a more diverse workforce and um, and also championing for a lot more sort of training. There's no vocational training for any position in the film industry. So I think that's another really important access point to be able to, you know, upskill people and train people and um, allow people to learn from some of the sort of the, 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 you know the great people in the industry with that have so much skill and uh and knowledge that perhaps won't even be here in five ten years time do you see what I mean like transferring that is really important that's fantastic both from the support from yourself and from and from Warner Brothers also and I think um very shortly we've got about 10 minutes for questions and we've got some really interesting questions that are coming through uh from people in the audience I'm going to start with a question from Xander, and this uh, I think we'll put over to Simon. Um, and it's a really useful question. It's what do you do as a producer during filming when you are on set? 
<laughs> um, I so I spent my time between uh, being on set and being in the office, um, and it depends. Every film, every day is different, but I will always be on set first thing in the morning, um, so eight o'clock, and uh, which is again just to make sure everyone's okay. I'll sit with the director. Um, I'll probably watch the first, you know, just watch the blocking, make sure everyone's okay. Then I go back to the office because the job really is always about prepping ahead. Um, and I always used to say as an assistant director, you're prepping ahead for the next few minutes. Um, as a production manager, you're prepping ahead for the next day. As a line producer, you might be prepping for the next week. And as a producer, hopefully you're prepping. I mean, right now I'm prepping for three years time. Um, so then I go back to the office, make a bunch of phone calls, have a bunch of meetings, and then I'll check in again on the set. And then there are some, if you're on a particularly difficult uh, location, I will literally just sit on the set and it's making decisions. Um, it's making financial decisions. Like, I mean, when we're on uh, Indy, we are on location, there's a gigantic storm coming in and you're the person that has to make the decision. Okay, we're going to abandon this. We're going to go and do that. Or actually, you know, why don't we just embrace it? Or whatever it might be like it's it's just yeah day-to-day -day decisions i want to say one thing i think is really important i wish somebody had told me years ago which in my opinion if you want to be a creative producer if you want to be the person that finds the material develops the material sees it all the way through i would say go out and just make films go to go to film school learn everything you can but just make films if you want to do what samar and i have done which is moving through into uh, you know much more of a physical production role i would say get into the industry start as a pa look around see is this really what i want to do but there's absolutely a, a ladder there um but i think that's really important to say there's for me there's two very different parts and ultimately i, mean, I think i've i'm lucky i've ended up um doing a little bit of both um but they're two very different paths would you agree with that samar yeah, absolutely. I would. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important if you want to have that, you know, the the experience of of being involved on a creative level with a director and with a writer potentially and stuff, that's a very different thing to, you know, to what to what you would learn going up the ladder as an assistant director or in production, for sure. And, and we've got another interesting question that's come through and it's regarding associate producer and associate producer roles on TV. Now, both of you, uh, and Simon, I know you, you've worked on different different television series and time you've worked on The Witcher as well. Um, so this question says, associate producer, assistant producer roles on TV and features are rarely advertised. Recently told it's a role that doesn't really exist by a well-known studio producer. Instead, it's a title one is given when doing other things. How does one get this role and credit? Um, well, in, in television, it's in, certainly in US television, um, writers now often get producer credits. Um, so that's why on television, you'll often see there's like, you think, God, there's 14 producers. What's that about? And it's the, uh, yeah, each writer will get a producer credit. And often um, the more junior writer might get a co-producer credit uh, moving up to producer. And it means something different in television than it does in film, confusingly. So in television, executive producer is sort of considered the, the highest position you can be. Um, and in film, uh, producer with what we call a capital P is considered the highest position. Um, so the truth is associate producer is not, it's not a defined role. And often it could be, it is recognizing that somebody is going over and above the role they're in. And so you want to give them that credit, which is not just a, it's not a gift, it's so that everyone else can look at them and understand, oh, they're, they're, you know, they're not just doing that. I'll give you an example. A lot of our senior accountants now will get financial controller slash associate producer. And we're not, it's not, again, it's not just a gift. It's saying this person is, you know, taking on a producerial function because they are, they, they go above and beyond what would traditionally be that role. And the truth is there are um, director's assistants and producer's assistants who end up getting these credits. But again, it's not just a gimme, which I think is, I mean, it does happen sometimes, but I think it's a little unkind. It's acknowledging this person is, is performing at a significantly higher level than their, than their title, their existing title. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not a defined advertised position 
uh, in my experience ever. Do you agree with that, Summer? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think we've got time for an, about two or three more questions. Um, so we've got another one here. What sort of transferable skills do you think can come from other jobs, roles outside of the film industry, like project or team management? That's an interesting one, because I think it's good for us to think about getting people into the industry who are perhaps not already in it or don't see an entry path into it. So what sort of transferable skills do you think can work in the role of a producer in production? Um, I mean, I think there are lots of transferable skills. I think essentially planning, organizing, anything that's sort of customer facing also is really good. You know, you're um, you know, working in a in a pub or working in a in in retail. Um, all of those skills of like managing money and you know and reporting and dealing with customers. Um, you know, we're often in situations where we have to in, in deal with, you know, members of the public if we're filming in places or we have to go and meet with councils and things if we if we want to, you know, set up a shoot somewhere. So, there, you know, and, and also sort of leading teams of, you know, like on Batman when Simon was leading a team of nearly 2000 people. So there is you know that there's a, a lot of transferable skills I think that can come from jobs and positions like that we we I... recently actually sorry we recently had on on Wonka there was a scheme transferring people from the aviation industry into film um because of the pandemic obviously aviation you know was suffering and so there was a lot of so we, we ended up employing a pilot for BA and he came in at to 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 help in our COVID department but then really you know enjoyed what he did and wanted to sort of go into production post that so you know there are there are lots of transferable skills I think from other other industries okay I, I was just going to say the customer service thing I couldn't agree more I always say that the the, the production team is customer service and that means if someone walks in with a problem, you don't go, oh, it's like, okay, well, you know, what do you got? You should be welcoming. And it's so yeah. important, as Samar said, like yeah. actually just dealing with people, dealing with all sorts of people and being able to do it in a, hopefully in a pleasant way, because my God, it makes the world go round. Yeah. Well, dealing with people, that leads me on to our next question from Max Phillips. And this is one for Simon. Simon, what is it like working with a director? Is there anything a director can do to make the process easier? This is perhaps someone who's already worked with a director. <laughs> <laughs> um, all, all directors are different. Um, I think really, I mean, it's a general piece of advice, but really trying to look at people's jobs and think, what is, what is it that's hard? Um, and I, I'm going to quickly move this to actors, but um, often... You can hear people say, oh, actors are so difficult, actors are so this, actors are so that. And again, one of the best pieces of advice I ever had was to read the call sheet, which is the, um, you know, every day we, we give everyone a piece of paper or an email now that says, here is our plan for the next day. And if that character, if a character in the scene, let's say they're going to their mother's funeral, well, it's not the time to be having fun and jokes with the actor who's playing that role. And so to sort of approach, especially actors, but I say this goes with directors as well, to think, what are we doing today? Is it the time to have fun and jokes? Is it the time to be a little more serious? Is it time to be quiet? What is it the director's getting at? What is the problem? Because often people will, um, if somebody was to, to you know, be a little animated or uh, frustrated, rather looking at that, um, at that frustration, it's okay, what is causing that? What can I do to help? Sometimes just listening. I work with a director who would say to me, can you, and I'd have a call and they say, can you come down to the set and see the director? Absolutely. And I go down and say, what's up? What do you, you know? What do you need? I just need you to be here. Okay. And this director said, it's just, I just like having you here. And it's, it can be as simple as that, that it's just giving somebody a level of comfort, security, um, but mainly thinking, yeah, what is that person? What is that person trying to achieve? And not taking 
necessarily the, the emotions at face value. What is causing that? How can I help? Um, and then there's also, obviously, there's logistical problems, you know, every day. How am I going to get the shot? The sun's going down. Uh, we're not going to finish a scene and thinking, okay, well, how, how can we do that? How can we figure it out? Um, and always trying to find a yes. And I'm also going to say, and I'll shut up after this, but there is such a, uh, when you think about telling stories, and I could use um, Star Wars as an example, you could make a Star Wars movie for, you could tell that story on the stage. In theory, it's a story. You could tell that story for a million dollars, a hundred million dollars, two hundred million dollars. We're lucky enough to tell those stories at the top end, but don't ever tell me it's impossible, because storytelling is something we've done since you know since human beings have been on the planet. Um, and so again, it's always thinking if if somebody is saying this is the only way it can be done, not just saying no, but but coming up with a well, could you do it this way? And often what I found is what I suggest won't be the thing that people will grab onto, but if it just helps them to reframe their own thinking and then they can come up with their own solution. Um, yeah. Well, I think that brings us to, to, a, to a close and what an incredible way to close with such inspirational words and just throughout. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Simon. You and Samar for taking time to share your experience and inspire, truly inspire a new generation of talent. Um, we look forward to seeing what you both create next and also what our audience who are listening today go on to create. Thank you once again for your time. This has been a hugely fascinating and inspirational talk today. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to everyone. Yeah, good luck. Thanks very much.